All right. If you're just joining us, go ahead and open up your chat box. I am looking forward to a wonderful session and I'm so glad you are here. Go ahead and say hello and where you're from in the chat box. I love how many people we have uh, right now coming into the classroom. This is absolutely awesome. We're gonna be starting in about five minutes, guys. So get ready and make sure that you have the handout ready as well. We're gonna fill that in as we are going through the session. I will be posting the handout link as well, just in case you missed it. So look for it in the chat box. All right, everyone, if you look in the chat box and click that Google Drive link, that will take you to the table, which we are going to be filling out as we master the cardiac cycle. If you are viewing this on YouTube, I've also put this in the stream chat box. All right, wow, we have so many amazing people in the chat box. Good morning, Mary Carmen, Mai, Suman, Hari Priya, Marco, Carmen, Ibi, Hari Priya, Preeti, Amish, Anjal, Yusuf, Edgar. Uh, thank you all so much for joining. Arvin, good morning, Adishwar. If you are just joining right now, please go ahead and type a hello or good morning into the chat box. We will be getting started soon. If you're just joining us and have missed the handout, please scroll up in the chat box. I posted the Google Drive link so you can follow along with me during this session. We're going to get started in just a little bit. 
All right. Good morning, everyone. I am so glad you are here joining me today for this webinar. This is going to be a jam-packed session, and it's going to be very high yield for your USMLE exam. I just want you all to stay active and engaged during this webinar. If you can hear me and see me, go ahead and type in yes into the chat box. Just want to do a quick audio visual check. Awesome. Wow. Look how many people we have today. That is absolutely amazing. Again, I did email a Google Drive link uh, to you all in your reminder email, and I've also posted it in the chat box. I'm going to go ahead and do it again. This will be a very high yield table for us to go through during this session. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be going through some important cardiac physiology topics. And I'm going to make it very practical because my goal is for you to think like the test maker. Just some ground rules for today. There are going to be probably some questions that come about throughout the session. I ask you if you can hold your questions until the end. I promise to stay afterwards and answer all of your questions and make sure that you have understood the concepts and are optimized for your studying. I first off just want to thank you all for attending. If you are new, welcome to the High Guru family. And if you've been to my webinars before, I especially welcome you back. And I really thank you for using these webinars and my resources for your USMLE preparation. As you may know, my name is Rahul. I am a second year pediatric critical care fellow. And most importantly, over the past six years, I have been absolutely passionate about helping students just like you kick ass on the USMLE exam. I absolutely love making sure that we grow this high guru family. I mean, look at this guys, we are an absolute community. And I've been humbled to teach classrooms all across the country. And today we are going to be going through some important concepts in the comfort of your own home. The way that I like to go about USMLE preparation is focusing on three things, learning the material, integrating the material, and applying the material. And what I want to base this review on and all of my resources is active recall, because that's what the evidence states is the best way to learn. I want to make sure that we integrate across organ systems so that you are able to actually conceptualize many of the high yield concepts. And most importantly, I want to make sure that I am relevant for the USMLE exam. Now, today we are going to have a high energy review. And my goal is to modify and motivate. I want to motivate you to be inspired to go through this whole process, study in an effective manner, and also master the cardiac cycle so that you can apply these important concepts to your NBME questions, to your actual exam, to those UWorld blocks that you're going through. So let's start with a little bit of an overview as to what we're going to be going through. I'm going to be focusing on three things today for our webinar. Number one, I'm going to be focusing on the cardiac cycle. We're going to be going through the Wiggers diagram step-by-step. Step. Number two, I'm going to be focusing on pressure volume loops. These frequently show up on exams. And number three, I'm going to be focusing on the cardiac action potential. And in particular, we are going to be comparing and contrasting the ventricular action potential with the sinoatrial action potential. All right, everyone. Let's go ahead and start with our first concept, which is going to be the cardiac cycle. I believe that this is the fundamental way for you to learn the, both the mechanical and the electrical activity of the heart. And these concepts come up both from a pathophysiology standpoint on your exam, as well as a pharmacology standpoint on your exam. So just a historical perspective, this cardiac cycle diagram is also known as the Wiggers diagram. The earliest description of this diagram is dates back to 1915 by Dr. Carl Wigger, 
who made this uh, important diagram that helps conceptualize the electrical activity and the mechanical activity of the heart. And he actually was one of the department chairs at Case Western University in Cleveland, Ohio. And that's where I did my pediatrics residency. So nice historical tie-in. And, you know, in honor of him, we are going to be going through this diagram and spending about our first half hour of this session really capturing the essentials from this diagram, breaking it down for you for the USMLE. Now, guys, you've probably seen this diagram in so many different texts, right? BRS, you've probably seen it in UWorld, you've seen it in First Aid. And if you just sit there and try to rote memorize these concepts, you know what's going to happen? Your head is absolutely going to spin. So today what we're going to do is really break down the cardiac cycle. And I'm gonna start by giving you some strategies on how to master the cardiac cycle. Number one, we're gonna do an active recall of the various cardiac events. We're gonna really ask ourselves, where's the blood actually flowing? We are also going to isolate each curve and understand the relationship between pressure and volume. And then what we want to really understand especially as we integrate these pressure and volume loops, as we integrate the EKG findings, you have to really understand, please, please put this in your mind. Electrical activity of the heart slightly precedes mechanical activity. What that means is that the P wave, which represents atrial depolarization, is going to precede what mechanical event? Ah, that's going to be atrial contraction or atrial systole. All right, so this is going to be the table that we are going to be using. Please fill out this table as we go along. We are really going to break down the cardiac cycle into systole and diastole. And so let's go ahead and first look at the major events that we have to define for the cardiac cycle. So just in an active recall manner, the first event which we're going to be talking about is isovolumetric ventricular contraction. And in this phase, as you can see, guys, there is no change in volume, but you notice that the ventricular pressure, which is that red line, is slightly increasing. The next phase is going to be ventricular ejection. I call this the sexy phase of systole. Why is that? Because that's where the blood is leaving the left ventricle and going into the aorta. So what defines this phase? Well, guys, it's going to be a decrease in ventricular volume, as well as an increase in aortic pressure as blood is going to be going from left ventricle into the aorta. Now, after this phase, we are going to be going into diastole. And if somebody asks you, what's the first phase of diastole? The answer is going to be, bam, you are going to be thinking of isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. After isovolumetric ventricular relaxation, remember this is a phase where the volume is not changing. However, the, the pressure in the ventricle is actually going down because we're talking about relaxation. You are going to have rapid inflow. And rapid inflow is a diastolic event, major diastolic event, in which you are going to have what? You are going to have blood going from the left atrium into the left ventricle, followed by this rapid inflow, um, uh, the phase that goes after this rapid inflow um, portion is going to be a reduced inflow portion, which we call the diastasis, not particularly high yield, but is actually one of the longer portions of this cardiac cycle. And finally, you are going to end diastole with atrial systole. Now guys, atrial systole has the word systole in it, but remember, it represents the atria, giving the last about 10% of preload into the ventricle. And what's really important for us to understand is atrial systole is actually going to be a diastolic event. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to shift this curve and we're going to talk about the major lines that this diagram is going to have. The first line is going to be the aortic pressure. And as you can see in ventricular ejection, we have an increase in aortic pressure, which makes sense as blood is going from the left ventricle into the aorta. We also have the atrial pressure tracing and the atrial pressure tracing has some very important portions that the USMLE likes to test. For example, 
They love for you to know that the A wave represents atrial systole. They love for you to know that. And we're going to get into it a little bit more, but that's the atrial pressure curve. The ventricular pressure curve is also going to be very relevant. That's in this red. And we saw that the ventricular pressure increased in isovolumetric ventricular contraction and it decreased in isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. But you notice in those phases, the ventricular volume, which is the curve in blue, both of, in both of those phases, you had no change in the volume. Now, the EKG is going to be important for us to integrate with the mechanical activity of the heart. Because remember, electrical activity slightly precedes your mechanical activity. So for example, if we have atrial systole, which is a mechanical event, that is going to be preceded by what electrical activity? That's going to be the P wave. And that's actually very important for you to understand. And then finally, we have what we call the phonogram. And the phonocardiogram is going to be the audible sounds that we hear with our stethoscope. We are going to be talking about the physiologic sounds, which is going to be the first heart sound, which represents the mitral and tricuspid valve closure compared to the second heart sounds, which is going to be the aortic and pulmonic valve closure. And then we have these somewhat pathological sounds that we hear it on uh, the phonocardiogram in various uh, cardiac um, phases. And these are actually going to be very important for our USMLA. Why? Because they love for you to know that the S3 represents the atria filling into a very dilated left ventricle. Whereas the S4 is going to be a late diastolic event. And that is going to represent the atria contracting into a very stiff, non-compliant ventricle. And this is such an important concept for us to know the difference between S3 and S4. S3 questions on your USMLE, that's going to be the patient who potentially has dilated cardiomyopathy, who potentially is going to have congestive heart failure. Whereas S4, that's going to represent patients who are going to have, for example, systolic hypertension or systemic essential hypertension, and chronically their left ventricle undergoes hypertrophy. And thus, you are going to have the S4 sound heard on exam, which represents, again, the atria contracting into a stiff, non-compliant ventricle. So the first phase we're going to be going through is isovolumetric ventricular contraction. Remember that this is the first phase of systole. Very important for us to understand. In this phase, I'm going to ask you, what do you think the heart is doing? Well, remember that the ventricles are contracting. And if the ventricles are contracting, what does this say about the pressure? Well, the pressure is actually going to be increasing. And subsequently, what EKG event precedes this mechanical activity? And that's going to be the QRS complex. Remember, electrical activity precedes mechanical activity. So the QRS complex, which represents ventricular depolarization, is going to precede this mechanical event of isovolumetric ventricular contraction. The next question we have is, what heart sound do you hear clinically at the beginning of this phase? So we are contracting the ventricles. What just happened prior to this? Hmm, that's going to be bingo. You are going to hear S1. Remember, S1 represents the mitral or tricuspid valve closure. And obviously, that's going to close, and then you are going to have isovolumetric ventricular contraction. So let's break this down on the Wiggers diagram. We see that we have isovolumetric ventricular contraction. We see that the ventricular pressure is going up and this is going to be related to the QRS complex. And most importantly, it's called isovolumetric. The ventricular volume is not changing. So when we think about isovolumetric ventricular contraction, remember that there is going to be an increase in ventricular pressure. And that increase in ventricular pressure is going to be after the mitral valve closed, which is going to be S1. So the mitral valve closes and bam, now we have an increase in that ventricular pressure. The reason why it's called isovolumetric is the pressure is increasing, the volume is remaining the same, and all valves are closed during this cycle. Just as a little aside, 
This diagram is actually from Gray's Anatomy's original textbook. Can you believe that? We're, we are learning medicine from a historical perspective today. But I wanted to use these images because, hey, they are so pretty and we're able to understand the cardiac cycle from these images. All right. So now we're going to move on to the sexy phase of systole. And that's going to be rapid ventricular ejection. So rapid ventricular ejection, what is the heart doing? Well, we are going to have now the ventricles contracting and the blood is flowing from where? The left ventricle into the aorta. As that blood is going into the aorta, the aortic pressure is increasing. And what do you think is happening to ventricular volume? Hmm. Ventricular volume during this phase is actually going down because the blood is going from left ventricle into the aorta. I know that this is some basic stuff and I know I'm repeating some stuff, but guess what? You need to burn it into your mind because these events are going to be essential. And if you don't have the good foundation, it's going to be very challenging for you to think on your feet during difficult exams and difficult questions in your UWorld blocks, as well as on the NBME exams. So on the EKG, what wave does this correlate to? Well, rapid ventricular ejection actually correlates to the ST segment. And that's why guys, as a clinical correlate, ST segment elevations or depressions are so profoundly impactful on this phase, rapid ventricular ejection. So when you are thinking about rapid ventricular ejection, what valve do you think is open? And that's going to be the aortic valve. Aortic valve is going to be open during rapid ventricular ejection. So let's break this down even more graphically. We see that in the ejection phase, the aortic pressure is going up, as you can see by the dotted lines. The ventricular pressure is also going up as the ventricles are contracting and the ventricular volume is going down. And you see the ST segment peaking in as the electrical activity related to this phase. All right, so rapid ventricular ejection. If I look at it from a visual standpoint, I know that my left ventricular pressure is going to be very high and blood is going to be going into the aorta. And as the blood goes into the aorta, what are you gonna have? Well, your aortic pressure is going to increase and that's important. Now, what kind of pathologies can the USMLA talk about during this phase? Well, remember that if you hear a systolic murmur heard best at the right second intercostal space at the midclavicular line, you are going to be thinking of what? You are going to be thinking of aortic stenosis. And aortic stenosis, on your USMLE, there are two kind of uh, questions that they love for you to know. One is the older person who has aortic stenosis just due to wear and tear of that aortic valve. But also, they want you to know that aortic stenosis can occur prematurely in those patients who have bicuspid aortic valve. So what patients have bicuspid aortic valve? Well, you might be born with it, such as, for example, on your USMLE exam, them talking about Turner syndrome, or watch for that 50-year-old male who, yes, was born with the uh, aortic um, or bicuspid aortic valve and now prematurely has aortic stenosis. Take-home point, bicuspid aortic valve ends up causing you to have premature aortic stenosis. So now let's go ahead and review some of the most important portions we talked about in systole. Remember, we started our discussion with isovolumetric ventricular contraction. And in this phase, you see that the ventricles are contracting, the pressure is increasing, it's related to the electrical activity of the QRS complex, all valves are closed, that's why the volume is constant, and right before this phase, you heard the first heart sound. What about ventricular ejection? Well, rapid ventricular ejection, the ventricles are contracting. You are going to have an increase in pressure. The blood is going to be flowing from the left ventricle into the aorta and your left ventricular volume is going to decrease. This represents what? This represents the electrical activity of the ST segment that's related to this phase. And we know that the aortic valve opens. Understand that aortic stenosis is going to be heard best during this phase. Aortic stenosis is going to be what? Aortic stenosis is a systolic murmur. 
So if I gave you just a little bit of a test taking strategy on how to master murmurs for your USMLE, I will say two things. Number one, understand that it's all about real estate, location, location, location. On the USMLE, they're going to have in the test question where exactly you are hearing it. Well, are you hearing the murmur in the mitral area? Are you hearing it in the second intercostal space aortic area on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side, second intercostal space, the pulmonic area? Figure out where the murmur is going to be heard. And then number two, categorize whether or not the murmur is systolic or diastolic. So understand that as a important test taking concept, because guess what guys, the murmur questions can sometimes show up on your USMLE as these multimedia questions in which you have to wear your headphones and you have to click on the diagram and actually listen to the sounds and characterize whether it's systolic, diastolic and where exactly you're hearing it best. Now guys, we are going to be moving on to diastole. Now, when we talk about diastole, we really have to understand that diastole starts with isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. So in isovolumetric ventricular relaxation, we have to ask ourselves, what exactly is the heart doing? Well, the heart in this phase is actually relaxing and the ventricular pressure is decreasing. But what do you note about the volume? Well, the volume in the heart is not changing. So understand that right before we ended up having this event, isovolumetric ventricular contraction, right before, what valve just closed? And that's the aortic valve. Remember the aortic valve was open during systole, now it's gonna be closed. Now, what heart sound do you hear clinically? The heart sound you're going to hear is going to be the second heart sound. Why? Because that is going to represent aortic valve closure. And remember the second heart sound, most importantly on your exam, has this aortic pulmonic split, which is going to be heard best on inspiration. So when we look at isovolumetric ventricular relaxation, that's a diastolic phase, you note that the ventricular pressure is actually going down, which is that red bar. We also notice that you have the um, ventricular volume being constant. And on your phonocardiogram, you just heard S2. Why? Because S2 represents the aortic valve closing, and now you're going to have this diastolic event. So isovolumetric ventricular relaxation, we note that the pressure is going down in the left ventricle. And the aortic valve, which is pictured right here, the aortic valve is actually going to be closed. Now in diastole, if the aortic valve is incompetent, which means that it is slightly open and leaky, you are going to have the diagnosis of aortic regurgitation. So remember, aortic regurgitation is going to be a diastolic murmur, whereas aortic stenosis is going to be a systolic murmur. Very important for you to know. And the way that I integrate it in my mind is I say, okay, what valve should be closed in diastole? Hmm. The aortic valve should be closed in diastole, but if it's not, that's pathology. So if the aortic valve should be closed in diastole, but it's not, you're gonna hear aortic regurgitation. So again, location, location, location. Usually this is gonna be at the right second intercostal space. You also are gonna note aortic regurgitation in patients on your exam that have, for example, connective tissue disorders, Marfan syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, Patients who have tertiary syphilis in which you get destruction of the vasovasorum, which is the blood vessels that are perfusing the aortic valve. These are all vignettes that you need to integrate with aortic regurgitation. All right, so moving on to the sexiest phase of diastole, we're gonna be talking about rapid ventricular filling. Now in rapid ventricular filling, let's ask ourselves, what's the heart doing? All right, so rapid ventricular filling, your heart, is going to have blood flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And the ventricles are passively filling with blood. And we note now that the ventricular volume is increasing because the blood is going from left atrium to left ventricle. Now, remember that the pressure is going to be low and constant. And this is actually going to be a very important concept for you to understand. And that is the concept of gradients. 
gradients really help you conceptualize cardiac questions on the USMLE. What that means, and we'll see it in the next slide, what that means is that you need to have a gradient from high to low, a high pressure system, which we note in this phase as the left atrium to a low pressure system, which is going to be in the ventricle. And how did we get that low pressure system? Well, we got that low pressure system from isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. The ventricles started relaxing in order for us to create that gradient between the left atrium and the left ventricle. Do you see guys how we're building on these concepts inch by inch? This is very relevant for your USMLE. Now, what valve is open during this time? You are going to note that the mitral valve is open during this time. So do you hear a murmur during this phase? Hmm. And likely you may not hear a murmur unless you have very severe mitral stenosis. But understand that you do not have a heart sound on the phonocardiogram during this phase. Why is that? Well, because usually on the phonocardiogram, the various sounds are going to be represented by valves closing. So yes, during this phase, you may have, for example, your mitral stenosis, very severe mitral stenosis, where you hear the opening snap. But remember, you won't hear S1, you won't hear S2. Why is that? Because those sounds, S1 and S2, are going to be not valves opening, but they are valves closing. So heart sounds that you hear clinically during this phase is pathologically or sometimes physiologically in athletes and adolescents is going to be the third heart sound. And I really want you to understand the third heart sound, guys. The third heart sound is going to represent the atria filling into a very dilated left ventricle. The atria, when it fills into a very dilated left ventricle, you are going to be thinking about the third heart sound. And that's seen in your test questions. For example, dilated cardiomyopathy related to trypanosoma cruzi, or you are going to have cardiomyopathy related to congestive heart failure or due to Coxsackie B. All of these different pathologies can cause you to have the S3 heart sound. And the S3 heart sound is what we call a early diastolic heart sound, an early diastolic heart sound. So let's go ahead and understand this on the graph after we talk about reduced ventricular filling. Reduced ventricular filling, again, I don't think that this is going to be super high yield for you on your USMLE exam, but just understand that the ventricles are relaxed and the mitral valve continues to be open as blood is going from the left atrium to the left ventricle, but at a reduced rate. Of note, this is one of the longest phases of the cardiac cycle. So one of the things that we have to understand are the vignettes that come with these certain phases. So I wanted to give you a sample vignette that we can apply. So here we have a patient who's undergoing an exercise stress test on the treadmill. What effect will this have on this phase of the cardiac cycle. Hmm. So during an exercise stress test, your heart rate is going to go up. And if your heart rate goes up, you are going to reduce the amount of time available for ventricular filling. And I think that that is actually really, really important for you to understand that if you have extremely high heart rates, you can actually reduce ventricular filling. You reduce diastole. Now, fine, dandy. That's great. If you are just seeing diastole in isolation, you're like, okay, wow, the ventricles are not filling as much. Well, what does that do? That actually reduces your cardiac output at times. But what's also important for you to know, guys, burn this into your mind. The coronaries fill during diastole. So if you have decreased time because of extremely high heart rates, if you have decreased time available for ventricular filling, you may compromise coronary perfusion. And that concept usually shows up on exams. So ventricular filling, remember, I talked about the G word and that is gradients. We have the left ventricular pressure being relatively low in order for us to have passive flow from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And that passive flow is all due to gradients. Remember that your left atrial pressure on your USMLE exam 
is also going to be known as your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. And your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is what I call a surrogate for left atrial pressure. So when is pulmonary capillary wedge pressure increased on your exam? Well, most importantly, they give you test questions related to congestive heart failure. And in congestive heart failure, you note that there is backup of blood from the left ventricle into the left atrium. And subsequently, you are going to have a high pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Why is that? Because pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is a surrogate for left atrial pressure. How do these questions manifest? Again, this review is so like chock full of USMLE pearls. And they usually ask these questions with arrow questions, right? They will ask you, okay, what is cardiac output? That's going to be low. What is pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? That's going to be elevated. These are just some basic questions, but understand that when you see pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, you can kind of conceptualize it as left atrial pressure. All right, guys, let's go ahead and just wrap up diastole. Understand that the AV valve is going to open during the phase after your isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. During diastole, you are going to have a ventricular pressure that's going to remain low and constant. And that allows that gradient from the left atrium into the left ventricle. And that's why your left ventricular volume is going to increase. So now let's go ahead and answer a sample USMLE question. And for those of you who know me, you know my strategy for answering questions is stem, paraphrase, and predict. Stem, let's start with the last line of the question. Which of the following physical exam findings would be less likely to be associated with this presentation? Now let's go line by line. A middle-aged male presents with shortness of breath while lying flat. He is found to have a three out of six holosystolic murmur that is heard best at the apex. Dilated cardiomyopathy is suspected. Which of the following physical exam findings would be less likely to be associated with this presentation? A, apical impulses shifted to the axillary line. B, S4 gallop. C, bibasilar crackles. D, peripheral edema. E, hepatomegaly. If you are still paying attention in this chat box, go ahead and type in your answer into the chat box. I would love for you to answer this question. Go ahead. All right, Nana is saying that. Lucas, we have a lot of awesome, awesome answers. And the answer is, you're absolutely correct. S4 gallop is going to be less likely to be heard in dilated cardiomyopathy. What are you going to hear? Well, you're likely going to hear the S3. And remember, the S3, if this is S1, closure of the mitral valve, and this is S2, closure of the aortic valve, remember that this is systole. And that means that the phase between S2 all the way back to S1, that's known as diastole. So an early diastolic sound in which the left atrium is going to be filling into a very dilated left ventricle, that's gonna be known as S3. And so we typically call that the S3 gallop. And the S3 gallop sounds something like this, Kentucky, Kentucky, Kentucky. Whereas the S4, which is a late diastolic sound, that sounds like tenacy, tenacy. Let's go ahead and conceptualize S4 a little bit more. And we're gonna conceptualize S4 during this final phase of diastole. Ah, it says atrial systole, but it's actually a diastolic event. Atrial systole, remember that during this phase, the atria is contracting, giving that last little bit of preload to the left ventricle. And so on the EKG, what does this correlate to? Hmm. So atrial systole is a mechanical event. And on the EKG, this correlates to the P wave because that's the electrical activity. Electrical activity which is atrial depolarization, precedes mechanical activity, which is atrial systole. Clinically, what do you hear on exam? Well, that's going to be the fourth heart sound. So what is the fourth heart sound? It is the atria contracting against a stiff, non-compliant ventricle. And I can't stress that enough. It's a late diastolic sound in which patients on your USMLE exam are going to have things like hypertension or anything that causes left ventricular hypertrophy because that makes the compliance of the left ventricle reduced. 
And what is compliance? Well, compliance is that ability to fill. If you have a thick, thick, thick left ventricle, you're going to have a decreased ability to fill, i.e. a decreased compliance. So as we can see in atrial systole, which is a diastolic event, you see that the atrial pressure is slightly increasing. And why is that? Well, that's known as that atrial kick, the atrial kick. And how does the USMLE kind of modulate this answer for you or modulate this uh, concept? And that is going to be giving you a patient with mitral valve stenosis. In mitral valve stenosis, you are going to have a prominent A wave. And why do you have a prominent A wave? Because if this is the atria and you have a very stenotic mitral valve, the atria is going to increase its pressure so, so high, and you'll see a prominent atrial pressure during mitral stenosis. Remember, in mitral stenosis, that can be actually due to what? Rheumatic fever. Rheumatic fever. Late stages of rheumatic fever, that's going to be mitral stenosis. That's the association. All right, so let's kind of re-go through this on this uh, diagram. Remember that if you have your mitral valve right here, normally you are going to have the atria contracting into the left ventricle. And that's going to give you that little bump up of preload, i.e. left ventricular and diastolic volume. But test questions that they love for you to know, mitral stenosis related to, for example, rheumatic fever. They also want you to understand that patients who have atrial fibrillation, if you have atrial fibrillation, you are going to lose the ability for the atria to contract during diastole because atrial fibrillation is this chamber of the heart kind of quivering over the left ventricle. And so what are other USMLA questions that they are going to ask? They're going to note that in atrial fibrillation, patients get stasis, and that's related to the gen path concept, Verkaus triad, stasis, endothelial injury, and hypercoagulable state. That stasis obviously leads to a clot. And if that clot goes up and goes into your brain, you end up getting a stroke. Or if that clot goes into your celiac or superior mesenteric artery, you are going to get intestinal ischemia, what we know as acute mesenteric ischemia. So do you understand how we're integrating things? I first tell you atrial fibrillation, it affects the atrial systole, which is a diastolic event. I say that that's going to cause you to have quivering of the atria, stasis of blood, and then watch for your vignettes. If they say atrial fibrillation and then badness happening afterwards, i.e. stroke, acute mesenteric ischemia, you are absolutely ready for it. All right. So let's go ahead and understand some of the various events. We know that isovolumetric ventricular relaxation, you are going to have the ventricles relax. There's going to be a decrease in pressure. All the valves are closed. And you just heard the second heart sound prior to this event. What does the second heart sound represent? The aortic valve closing. Rapid ventricular filling. The ventricles are still relaxed, but the ventricular volume is increasing. The mitral valve is going to open. And if the atria are filling into a very dilated left ventricle, you're going to hear the third heart sound. Rapid ventricular filling, as you know, and excuse me, that's supposed to be reduced ventricular filling. Sorry about that. Reduced ventricular filling, you are going to have the mitral valve continuously be open. And then we have atrial systole in which the atria is contracting, giving that last little bit of preload to the left ventricle. The Electrical activity that preceded this mechanical event is the P wave, which represents atrial depolarization. The mitral valve is going to be open. And if the atria is contracting against a stiff, non-compliant ventricle, you are going to hear the fourth heart sound. All right. So we are going to be talking a little bit about the jugular venous tracing. Now, the jugular venous tracing is basically us looking at the pressure where in the atria. And we have a catheter with a pressure probe, and that is going to be right in the atria. So think about the JVP tracing as a pressure probe right kind of here, okay? And in a structurally normal heart, we sometimes think of this JVP tracing on the right side of the heart, but also on the left side of the heart. It's just very hard for a catheter to reach that left side of the heart. So that's where the catheter is. And let's start with the various events. We see that A wave represents right atrial contraction. 
And we already had that test question related to microstenosis and how you would get a very prominent A wave. Remember that the C wave is going to represent the bulging of the tricuspid valve during ventricular contraction. Obviously, after you had the A wave, which is atrial contraction, you had the tricuspid valve, talking about the right side of the heart, close. And if you have that tricuspid valve close, the next step is going to be what? Isovolumetric ventricular contraction. And in isovolumetric ventricular contraction, you may get a increase in right ventricular pressure, but most importantly, a little bit of a bulge back in to the right atrium. And so that is known as the C wave. The X descent is right atrial relaxation in which now as the right ventricle is contracting, doing its thing in the bottom, you are going to have the right atrium starting to relax. Why do you have the right atrium starting to relax? Well, guys, it's all about gradients. You need to have a gradient between your superior and inferior vena cava and have that gradient so that blood can passively fill into the right atrium. So atrial relaxation is going to be the X descent. Now, the V wave is going to represent inflow of the venous blood. So let me do that in blue. You note that the venous blood is gonna come from the SVC, from the IVC. Now that the atrial pressure is going to be low, thanks to the X descent, the V wave represents, ah, it is going to be filling, the vena cava are going to fill the atrium. And then finally, you have the Y descent. And the Y descent is going to represent all of this blood that is in this highlighter blue going down into the right ventricle because you have passive emptying of the right atrium after tricuspid valve opening. So now what we need to understand is that the JVP tracing, super important for you to know. I think the prominent A wave is going to be your test question, but you now know the whole phase and all of the elements of the JVP tracing. All right. Wonderful. Let's go ahead and go through this question. We're going to say the word stem first. What is the most likely vital sign change which may be present in this patient? Let's go line by line. A 30-year-old male is hit in the chest with the baseball bat. He is tachycardic and has shallow respirations. On palpation of his abdomen, a prominent jugular vein is appreciated. Bedside echo shows a collapsed atria on diastole. What do you think is going to happen? Go ahead and take some time and answer this question. Put your answer into the chat box. This is a tough question. And as this session is going on, we're building on concepts. We're building on concepts. Hmm. What do you think the answer is here? Well, whenever you see the atria being collapsed in diastole, especially after a trauma, you should think about an important, important pathology, and that is cardiac tamponade. And in cardiac tamponade, you are going to hear something known as pulsus paradoxus. So now let's go into what is pulsus paradoxus? Well, that is actually answer choice D or uh, excuse, um, answer choice, which is, oh, did I make a mistake here? Sorry. It is going to be a decrease in systolic blood pressure by 10 during inhalation. I apologize for that. So the answer, everybody got it uh, correct because I didn't put the correct answer in there, but it is a decrease in systolic blood pressure by 10 during inhalation. So when you're thinking about pulses paradoxes, that finding 
is seen in various pathologies, but most importantly on your USMLE, it is going to be seen in cardiac tamponade. Now in cardiac tamponade, remember that there is fluid that surrounds the heart. And if there's fluid that surrounds the heart, what we have to understand is that, <coughs> excuse me, the non-muscular chambers of the heart, i.e. the atria, those are going to collapse during diastole. Because there is so much fluid, as the atria is going to relax, remember during that X descent, you are going to have the collapse of the atria. Now on your USMLE, you are going to note a triad that sneakily shows up for cardiac tamponade. And that is what? JVD, hypotension, and muffled heart tones. But you need to understand that the practical way this shows up on your exam is they'll say physical exam shows a prominent jugular vein. Blood pressure in the vital signs is going to be low. And you are going to hear heart sounds that are inaudible or muffled. Now, what happens during cardiac tamponade that you get pulses paradoxus? Well, remember, as the left ventricle or right ventricle, because it's a more non-muscular chamber, as the right ventricle is going to expand, 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 you're going to have an impedance of actually expanding that right ventricle. So if you can't expand that right ventricle, well, the interventricular septum is going to shift over. And let me do that in red. So you really conceptualize that. And as the interventricular septum shifts over, you are going to have a impedance in the left ventricular outflow track. And if you're going to have the impedance in the left ventricular outflow track, you are actually going to have this phenomena of pulses paradoxes. Because during inspiration, you increase preload, that causes you to have an exaggerated shift in your interventricular septum, such that you decrease your systolic blood pressure by 10 during this time. And so why were, was it called pulses paradoxes? What's the paradox? Well, the paradox is, is that you are still going to hear a heartbeat, but during inspiration, you did not have a pulse. You still hear a heartbeat, but you did not have a pulse. That's a paradox. And remember, pulses paradoxes is a decrease in systolic blood pressure by 10 during inspiration. They love for you to note that and pathologies like cardiac tamponade can lead to pulses paradoxes. All right, we are almost rounding out the session. I do want to go through pressure volume loops with you. Now, pressure volume loops, I want you to recognize the various labels. Number one, let's go ahead and do this active recall question. A patient has a rumbling diastolic murmur that's heard at the apex. The snap of this murmur occurs at which of the following points? Hmm. So a rumbling diastolic murmur heard at the apex, location, 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 that is mitral stenosis. And you hear the opening snap of mitral stenosis where? Well, when the mitral valve opens. And so that's going to be answer choice D. That is where the mitral valve opens. So let's go ahead and go through all of these cardiac events. Remember that A represents the mitral valve closure. And that mitral valve closure is going to be related to what heart sound, guys? S1. Yes, that's going to be related to S1. Remember that your end diastolic volume is going to be very, very high when the atrial or when the uh, mitral valve closes. Why is that? Because the ventricles just got filled. Point B is going to represent aortic valve opening. So what's this point between A and B? That's isovolumetric ventricular contraction. And isovolumetric ventricular contraction, you are going to have an increase in your pressure, which is going to be this y-axis, but no change in your volume. And you recognize that the QRS complex is going to be the electrical activity that precedes this mechanical activity. And all valves are going to be closed during this phase. And then at point B, the aortic valve is going to open. At point C, you are going to note your aortic valve close, ASD, just a nice little test taking pearl. And then D is going to represent the mitral valve opening, which we just covered in that active recall question. So what's the point between C and D? 
Well, you remember the, the volume is not necessarily changing, but the pressure is decreasing. And if the pressure is decreasing, you're worried about or thinking about isovolumetric ventricular relaxation. Now, let's understand some important physiology concepts here. This right here, point B represents your end diastolic volume, and point C represents your end systolic volume. So remember, hey, I'm done filling is end diastolic volume. Hey, I'm done contracting is end systolic volume. So EDV minus ESV, that's known as your stroke volume. And so what if I gave you this EDV, hey, I'm done filling minus, hey, I'm done contracting, which is your stroke volume and divided it by EDV, which is going to be the original. Well, that's known as your ejection fraction. So your ejection fraction, which we commonly see in test questions come up during uh, uh, questions related to congestive heart failure, ejection fraction is merely your stroke volume over your end diastolic volume, the change over the original. And also note that two, um, and also note that when you're talking about stroke volume, stroke volume is actually one of the mediators for cardiac output. So remember, cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. You know that. And what are the mediators that affect stroke volume? That's going to be contractility, afterload, and preload. So how to optimize your stroke volume? You increase contractility, you increase preload, and you reduce afterload, i.e. the resistance coming out of the heart. So why did I put these two stars here? And I'm going to put um, a blue highlighter to show you this. Well, remember that this portion right here, where this first star is, right before your aortic valve opens, that's going to be known as your diastolic blood pressure. Your diastolic blood pressure is going to be right before your aortic valve opens. And then this curve right here, this star, that's going to be your systolic blood pressure because that's going to be the peak of ventricular ejection. So another way to kind of conceptualize this and now what we're going to do is we're going to look at various changes that they put on the USMLE. So remember that the black is going to represent the original and the red is going to represent the change. And as you can see, you have an end diastolic volume here, but look at this end systolic volume. This end systolic volume is actually a little bit less. So what are test vignettes related to this? Well, the concept here is for us to understand that this may represent increased contractility. The heart is squeezing more. And if you have higher contractility, you are going to have a higher stroke volume. And thus, you're going to end at a lower end systolic volume, end of systole. So that high stroke volume is going to also be related to the concept of a high ejection fraction. And understand that your USMLE vignettes relevant to this change are going to be worded in the following way. They'll say increase beta-1 mediated activity. Maybe they gave dobutamine. Maybe they gave epinephrine. That pharmacology question is going to be very important. Increase in intracellular calcium. Remember that if you phosphorylate phospholamban, you are going to get an increase in intracellular calcium, which is going to cause you to have an increase in contractility. What about this one? A patient started on a medication for heart failure and suddenly develops vision changes and increase K. Hmm. What do you think this is? Well, the point that I'm going for here is going to be digoxin toxicity. You're absolutely correct. So remember, digoxin is used as an agent to increase contractility. It has a narrow therapeutic index. And we note that the mechanism of action is blocking the potassium leaflet of the sodium potassium ATPase. So when patients have digoxin toxicity, they can get hyperkalemia. And what's important for us to know in the mechanism of action of digoxin is that yes, it inhibits the sodium potassium ATPase, but as a result, it makes calcium more difficult to leave the myocyte. And so if calcium is within the intracellular space of the myocyte, you get increase in contraction. Another advanced concept that you can see in test questions is understanding the slope of these curves. And let me highlight the first slope in green. 
and you see that this represents your end systolic pressure volume relationship. And that's actually really important for us to know. End systolic pressure volume relationship. And if the slope is going to be downtrended, like for example, in the green line that you see, that's going to represent a decrease in ionotropy, i.e. a decrease in contractility. Whereas if you see a patient or a curve on your USMLE with the slope that's a little bit more steep, that means that you have a higher steep and that means you have an increase in ionotropy. And that increase in ionotropy is the same thing as increase in contractility. You note that your end systolic volume is going to be obviously on the lower end because your heart is squeezing more of that blood out. And those were the vignettes that we just talked about in the last slide. Another element that we need to think about is going to be the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. So you see here that there is not only a curve that we see at the top where the lines were, but in purple, watch my purple line. This represents the end diastolic pressure volume relationship. And that is kind of related to the compliance of the heart. So for example, if you have increased compliance, you are going to have a shift this way. Whereas if you have a decrease in compliance, think about a very stiff, stiff, stiff left ventricle. You are going to have a decrease in compliance. The shift of those curves may show up on your exam. And so remember, when you have decreased compliance, that means that the left ventricle is going to be very, very thick left ventricular hypertrophy. All right, another important curve for you to understand is going to be a curve in which you have an increase in preload. And so you have an increase in preload. That means that you are going to have a higher end diastolic volume. Remember, left ventricular end diastolic volume is the same thing as preload. Just understand. Basically, to summarize it, it is how much shit goes back to the heart, i.e. how much blood goes back to the heart. That is going to be your preload, which is your end diastolic volume. So remember, when you have an increase in venous tone, all of that blood that is pooled in your venous system, that is going to go up and go into your heart and you get an increase in end diastolic volume. So exercise, for example, causes you to release a lot of catecholamines and you increase your venous tone and that shifts you to having more preload to your heart. High venous tone related to exercise, that's a common question that they ask on the USMLE. Nitrates, for example, do the opposite. Nitrates are going to decrease your venous tone and it, they're going to cause you to have pooling of the blood into your extremities. Another USMLE vignette is going to be the following. Here you have a patient who recently was placed on hemodialysis for chronic kidney disease. The patient is noted to have a hyperdynamic precordium. So they're bouncing, bouncing, bouncing. They have bounding pulses. What is the diagnosis? Well, remember, anytime on your USMLE questions, you see an AV fistula, man, think about an increase in preload. I cannot, call, I cannot stress that enough, that an increase in preload is going to be due to an AV fistula in which the blood is bypassing your capillaries and you're going artery to vein and bam, back to the heart. So AV fistula is very important. Questions related to AV fistula, related to um, chronic kidney disease and having a dialysis catheter, or even for uh, fracture healing. Remember that during fracture healing, you have an increase in blood vessels that occur in your bone. Remember those Haversian and Volkman canals? Exactly. That histology tie-in is very relevant here. You get more arteriovenous connections. Passive leg raise, as well as squatting, those are two maneuvers that are going to increase the amount of blood coming back to your heart, i.e. increase your preload. And remember, guys, you have an increase in end diastolic volume during this time. All right. Another thing that is going to increase your preload is going to be inspiration. Please know this. Inspiration is going to increase your preload. Am I an inspiration to you? Dad joke. But inspiration is going to increase your preload. Why? Well, 
understand that during inspiration, follow this graph with me, you have an in, intercostal muscles that are going to contract and you are going to have the diaphragm contract. Remember that inspiration is going to be an active process. And what does that do? Well, that causes your pleural pressure here. I'm going to highlight in yellow, your pleural pressure ends up becoming very negative. Well, if your pleural pressure ends up becoming very negative, you have a better gradient that forms between your vena cava system here in blue and what? Yes, you got it. Your right atrium, which is going to be marked in purple right here. So as you are going to expand the lungs with your inspiration, you get a negative intrapleural pressure and that causes blood from the SVC to ha ah, plop into the right atrium. And so in pathologies such as constrictive pericarditis, this relationship actually is not going to be there because your heart is going to be unable to take that preload that is coming from the SVC and the IVC, especially during inspiration. Why? Because constrictive pericarditis, the heart is trying to come out, but ooh, there's calcification surrounding that heart. What are vignettes related to that? Ah, recurrent tuberculosis, for example, that's going to cause you to have constrictive pericarditis. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the way that you have to learn, right? You have to learn the concept. And the way that I like to teach it is I like to say, hey, yo, how does it present on the exam? How does it present on the exam? How do the test makers go for it? What is the strategy to get to the correct answer? That's innovative. That's unique. Let's keep going. Five more slides, guys. Five more slides. Stick with me. Respiratory muscles are going to contract during inspiration. You are going to get an increase in your negative intrapleural pressure. Obviously, your intrapleural pressure is going to become more negative. You're going to get more of your venous pool, causing you to have a higher venous return. And the other mediators are a little bit more advanced, i.e. your decrease in right ventricular afterload or an increase in LV afterload. You don't need to worry about that right now on this slide, but I do want to let you know that inspiration causes a negative intrathoracic pressure and increases your preload. Please know that concept for your USMLE. All right, just wrapping up here. You are going to note here in this curve, anytime you see the curve shifting upwards, put that capital A, just like first aid has it. I like that mnemonic. That means that you have an increase in afterload. You also are going to have an increase in end systolic volume. Why is that? Because after you contract, and if you have a high afterload system, you're contracting, 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 contracting. But because you are unable to actually contract all of the blood due to high resistance in the aorta, your end systolic volume, the volume after systole is going to be increased. Why? Because you weren't able to pump it out. And so thus you have a reduced stroke volume because remember stroke volume is going to be end diastolic volume minus end systolic volume. And so if you have a higher end systolic volume, your stroke volume is going to go down. So what are going to be USMLE vignettes related to this change? Well, afterload is largely dependent on aortic pressure, high aortic pressure, high afterload, your left ventricle gets pissed off. High blood pressure is going to cause an increase in afterload. And then also this question right here, a 70 year old man who presents with passing out, he has chest pain, non-tender to palpation. Walk test notes dyspnea. A murmur at the right second intercostal space is noted. What is the likely mechanism? So in this patient, you note, ah, syncope, ah, angina, ah, dyspnea. And this is related to aortic stenosis. And remember, it's an elderly person, so it's age-related calcific stenosis. Aortic stenosis causes you to have a high afterload. So you can see this curve in aortic stenosis. So remember that if I gave you the same question and I changed this to like a 50 year old patient, think about bicuspid aortic valve that causes you to have premature aortic stenosis. Very important for you to know. All right, guys, cardiac action potentials. We're going to be talking about the ventricular and we are going to be talking 
about the sinoatrial action potential. Stick with me here. Where is the ventricular action potential? Well, in order to conceptualize it, it's primarily going to be in the muscles of your left ventricle, also in the muscles of your atria. That's where you see this action potential. So remember that this action potential is going to be defined by phase zero, in which sodium is going to come in very quickly. Phase one is just the abrupt closure of the sodium channel, not as high yield. But phase two is actually really, really important, in which you have this isoelectric stage. Calcium is coming in through the L-type calcium channels, and potassium is coming out. And that type of charge differential causes you to have a neutral line on the action potential. Phase three, just like in skeletal muscle, for example, or just like even in the nodal action potential, as we're going to talk about, that is going to be potassium effluxing out, and you're going to have repolarization back to phase four. And remember, phase four of the ventricular action potential is defined by potassium. Very important. Phase four from the ventricular action potential is defined by potassium. Many cell membranes actually are defined by the equilibrium potential of potassium. So in ventricular muscle, what ion determines phase four of the cardiac action potential? We talked about this. That's going to be your potassium permeability. And recognize that phase zero is going to be related to sodium influx. And what phase of the ventricular action potential defines the difference between skeletal action potential versus ventricular action potential? And that is phase two. Remember phase two, that was what? Here we have zero, one, and ah, two. That's very unique to ventricular action potential. Remember that skeletal action potential is very simple, up, down. Ventricular action potential has that phase two, that isoelectric phase. Other differences between cardiac and skeletal muscle. Remember cardiac muscle has what we call calcium induced calcium release and Cardiac, action, uh, cardiac muscle has gap junctions. And those gap junctions are really important because that's what allows the electrical activity of the heart to kind of propagate everywhere and allows the ventricles in particular to contract in a syncytia. Did we just go through physiology, a little bit of histology? We went through a little bit of anatomy. We are putting all of the puzzle pieces together. And this is the way that questions are also asked in this integrative fashion. All right, wrapping up, guys, the nodal action potential. This is typically seen, see where all this red stuff is? In the SA node, in the AV node, right? You see this type of action potential. The other one was in the muscles. This is seen in the actual electrical portions, the circuitry. You see that the phase four of this action potential is actually going to be defined by funny channels. And those sodium funny channels are going to be these leaky, leaky channels that as soon as you then hit threshold, you are going to trigger phase zero. And put a star right here because phase zero in the nodal action potential is calcium mediated. If I asked you what was it in the ventricular action potential, you would say that that was sodium. Sodium is phase zero in the ventricular action potential. In the nodal action potential, it's calcium. There is no plateau phase. So adios, phase one and phase two. And phase three is going to be potassium repolarization. All right, guys. Well, if we look at this application question as we close this session, let's go through it. A farmer is working in the field and suddenly experiences lacrimation, rhinorrhea, and diarrhea. He is wet, 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 leaky, leaky, leaky. He begins to have sweating and bronchospasm. So he has what? High parasympathetic state. His heart rate is found to be 45. You notice that he has high parasympathetic state. So if you have a high parasympathetic state, this is going to be your organophosphate poisoning. And yes, the neurotransmitter that's going to be elevated is going to be acetylcholine. Now, what phase of the nodal action potential does his bradycardia affect? Well, that's going to be phase four. Remember, phase four of the nodal action potential actually defines your heart rate. And that's high yield for you to understand. In fact, if I gave you different curves, remember that bradycardia, I'm going to put it in red, is going to represent your phase four slope going like this, in which it takes longer for you 
to actually fire that action potential. And that is basically what? Bradycardia. Bradycardia is going to be a very prolonged phase four slope. And remember, phase four determined uh, uh, is going to be mediated by what? It's going to be mediated by your funny channels. All right. Well, enough funny jokes. Today, we have covered a lot. I really encourage you all to put in the chat box questions. Before you start asking your questions, I do want to let you know that I have many resources for you to check out. Number one, I do want to let you know that when I was going through my USMLE preparation, it took me forever to go through my UWorld blocks, especially the dense explanations. So I made a set of notes for you that you can use to follow along with your UWorld explanations, have everything in one place so you don't have to make a very detailed journal on your own. I did give you a sample of the cardiology um, and I will provide that also at, at the end of the session. And then I have revamped my rapid review course. And the rapid review course, guys, is basically the top concepts that you need to know for your exam. I recommend you getting this like three, four, five weeks before your exam, or even right before you take an NBME, you can watch this rapid review course. Now, there are some free lectures, there are some paid lectures, but let me tell you, even if you don't get my rapid review course, let me tell you what I think is so important in the days leading up to the exam. That's why I made this resource because I was like, holy shit, I don't know what to study in the days leading up to the exam. And I think that chapters one through three of Pathoma, which I have made an active recall integrative, just like this question-based review of the concepts, that's in my rapid review course. The first aid rapid review section, forget the Anki cards. I mean, come on, you need to go through the first aid rapid review section in an organ system based way. So you'll see in those lectures, you'll see, bam, cardiology, what are the top concepts? Endocrine, what are the top concepts? And I give you these pearls, test taking pearls as you're going through. I also wanted to make a lecture reflecting the October and November 2020 changes, because I know this is anxiety provoking for a lot of us. What are they going to test? Well, I went through the newest content outline and I said, all right, here are the ethical concepts and the ethical scenarios they may test. The patient safety concepts, PBLI, these are all important, important elements that they are starting to put now more with these November um, changes. 100 concepts in gross anatomy. I have a lecture on YouTube on that. That's part of my rapid review course. That's a free one for you guys to check out just to see if you like the way that I'm teaching. Autonomic pharmacology, I also think that that's important because remember, those questions are going to have a lot of not only farm tie-ins, but physiology tie-ins. You got to know, for example, in my lecture, I say alpha-1 causes vasoconstriction. Well, beta-2 causes vasodilation. V1 causes vasoconstriction. So see, I'm comparing and contrasting things. And this is just a very dynamic way to learn. And I've asked you so many questions throughout this session. Next, I think it's important for us to go through metabolic pathways. So I've made a active recall PowerPoint that you can flip through right before your USMLE exam and master things like glycolysis, things like fatty acid oxidation, et cetera. And you can at least get the endocrine tie-ins that's related to biochemistry, as well as the physiology and path tie-ins. So this course is really, really important for you to really kind of get and also make sure that you just cover these material. Even if you don't get the course, go through Pathoma chapters one through three, go through the rapid review. These are the essential elements. Here is the pricing um, for um, all of these uh, resources. I also have a study plan that comes with a session with me that I walk you through how to make a study plan. And feel free to just email me if you are interested in any of this. And also check out my website, my website, highguru.com. I just actually uh, revamped this website. So check it out. I made a cool video and everything like that. All of these purchases that you make on my website, guys, goes back into making these kind of webinars for you, making YouTube videos, study diagrams, integrative questions, et cetera.
I really thank you all for attending and I would be more than happy to take any questions at this time. Thanks again for your active participation. All right.